Okay, welcome uh, everybody. Uh, um, this is one of the lecture series that I give monthly uh, to the community. Uh, the goal is to try to enhance the knowledge of the kidney and kidney diseases among the population and patients. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I thought today I would talk about something that's confusing to patients and their families, and that is to understand the meaning of creatinine, GFR or EGFR and CKD, because these things are always bantered about when you go to the doctor or you see it in your electronic medical record, and they're very confusing. Why do we have all these terms? Sometimes doctor ref doctors refer to the creatinine, sometimes they refer to your EGFR, sometimes they talk about your CKD stage. So I thought today I would focus on that um, and then go address some of the questions you might have along those lines or any other questions you might have that have to do with kidney disease. So welcome again, everybody. So I thought I would just start today by showing you again where the kidneys are, what they are, uh, and they're quite small. They're in the back. There's two of them, as, as you probably know, and they're about a third of a pound uh, each. So they're sitting in the back. And what they do is if someone says to you, what do the kidneys do? You get different answers. Some people will say, oh, the kidneys uh, get rid of poisons. Others will say the kidney is a filter. But the correct answer is, uh, if and which is not too technical, but is but is the accurate answer, is the kidneys keep the chemistry of your blood in the in the appropriate range. The blood has a chemistry that's very complicated with thousands of different substances. And three times a day, we're changing that chemistry because of what we eat. And if you don't have the ability to bring the chemistry back to normal, you will die. So the kidneys evolved and they're, they're like a computer. So I actually call the kidneys a chemical computer. Uh, the brain is a, like a computer too. It takes in information and makes decisions. Well, the, the kidney is a chemical computer. It takes in chemical information and makes decisions as to what to get rid of from the body and what to retain. So the kidneys are essential in order to maintain life because our blood chemistry is constantly being perturbed by what we eat. And that chemistry has to be brought back to normal within a certain period of time. If we can't do it because our kidneys are very, very abnormal, we have to do it artificially, either uh, with hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, which is a very poor substitution of what the kidneys are doing. The kidneys work 24 seven. They don't know what a holiday is. They don't know what your sleep is. They don't know what being tired is. That's your brain making up all these things. The kidneys work around the clock for your entire life. Never take a rest, just like your heart. Okay, so this is an important slide because it's important to know that the kidneys and their function is not the same at every age. Now, many doctors don't realize this, and it has implications because, as you see here, men and women roughly follow the same curve. Your kidney function is normal only until you're in your 50s. But after you're in your 50s, this is normal people now. This is not a disease. In normal people, the function of the kidney declines. It's, it would be analogous to say my vision is my ability to read declines as I get older, or my memory is declining as I get older, or my ability to, you know, to run 10 miles declines. The same thing occurs with the kidneys. And it's important to know this because many doctors don't know this. Even nephrologists don't know this. And when, if you, if you look at this, and, and here I'm not showing creatinine and I'm not showing EGFR, I'm just calling it 100% just for simplicity. The function of the kidney is roughly 100% in your 50s. But as you age, that function declines. And so when you get to be about 75, you can be below 80% of normal. Now, when you get your lab slips back, you don't get percent normal function. You get something called EGFR or CKD stage. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the implication here is if the doctor doesn't know that there's a normal decline with age, you could be misdiagnosed as having CKD. Or if they get an, uh, an EGFR of 70 or something or 75, if they don't know any better, they'll say that EGFR is below normal. It should be 95 or 100. 
and they'll say you have CKD when you don't have CKD. And that's a very important take home message. We do not call the drop in GFR that occurs with age an abnormality, nor do we call it a disease. That is our new baseline. So if you are 75 and you're, you have 80% of your kidney function and it looks like you have CKD, but that's what you would expect to see for that age, we don't call that CKD. You don't need to see a nephrologist. Unfortunately, that age-dependent fall is really, really not well known. And both primary care doctors and nephrologists tell patients who are 75, 80, 85 that they have kidney disease, and they don't. They just have the normal age-dependent decline. And so it's very, very important if, if uh, you know, you fall into this boat or you, you have a loved one who does or friend, please make them aware of the age-dependent normal decline. Now, here's the confusing terms that you'll find in your EMR, the doctor will talk about. So my purpose today is to briefly go over these terms and what they mean. So there's something called creatinine that you'll see in the EMR, and you know, there's something called your EGFR, and there's something called your CKD stage. And I'll talk about each of these and what they mean and how to think about them. And as you'll see from what I say ultimately, the interdependence between these three. And the fact, as you will see, that they're not really saying anything different. Is we have the three different ways of saying the same thing. I hope I'll be conveying to you. But just as a general idea, the first important thing to know is that of those three terms, the only one that is a blood test that we're actually measuring is your creatinine. We don't measure the EGFR and we don't measure anything called CKD. And I'll talk about what those mean and how we get those concepts. The only thing that's actually being measured is the blood creatinine level. And if you did nothing else, if you only had the creatinine level and there was no such concept in the world as CKD, you rid the world of the concept CKD, you rid the world of the concept EGFR, you could still interpret the creatinine. And so this is what is shown here. When your creatinine is around one, you have roughly 100% normal kidney function. When your creatinine doubles, it's inversely what we call mathematics. In mathematics, it's called inversely related. One goes up, one goes down. When your creatinine goes from one to two, you lost half your renal function. You have 50% of your kidney function. That's the concept. When your creatinine goes from one to four, you've lost 75%, you have a quarter of the kidney function left. This actually is the most important concept of everything I'm gonna be talking about in lieu of CKD stage, which is sort of an added on concept. And in lieu of your EGFR, which is an added on concept. This is the most important take home message if you forget everything else I'm saying tonight, that the number one, the creatinine is what they measure whenever you get a blood test. In fact, it's measured in very routinely, it's not a special test. So every human should know what their creatinine is throughout their life because it's such an easy way of assessing your kidney function. We don't have things like that in the rest of medicine. And this has been around since the 40s and 50s. This is not some new fancy test. Pe doctors have been measuring creatinine since World War II or before. And this relationship has held since then. There's nothing new in the last 80 years. Now, this is a rough guide. It's not perfect. But as a rough guide, you want your creatinine to be one. And that tells you you have normal kidney function. Now, I want to say one thing, which I will repeat. You only need to go on dialysis or get a kidney transplant when your kidney function gets to 15% of normal. You can have 50% of normal and live a nice life. You can have 30% of normal and live a nice and healthy life. We have a huge redundancy. Now, it's not because one kidney is affected and the other isn't. I'm not talking about you can get 50% by taking out one of your kidneys also. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying both kidneys are declining together. So both the total function of both kidneys is 50% of normal. 
that's what we're, we're talking about or the, or the total function is 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 25 percent of normal and i'll talk about what function i haven't mentioned yet what function of the kidney we're even talking about that i'll talk about in a second it's a very specific function and the reason i bring that up because it's because the kidney has hundreds of functions it doesn't do just one thing it does hundreds of things but there's only one thing that is important for determining whether you go on dialysis or one major thing. And there's only one of the functions that is affected by your serum but, or reflected by your serum creatinine. Now, another misnomer is that the creatinine is a poison. It's not a poison. I can give you a truckload of creatinine and nothing will happen to you. It's just an indirect reflection of what your kidney function is. The fact that it's going up from one to four is not what's harming you. It's just an indirect reflection of the abnormal kidney function. And I'll talk about in a minute what that particular kidney function is. So I, I hope that that's clear. And if it's not, when we get to the question and answer period, please ask me to review that again. Now, this is a complicated slide. It's one of the complicated slides, so I'll go over it slowly. And what it shows is, first of all, it's an XY plot. This is the X axis and this is the Y axis. And there's numbers here going from zero to 120. And there's numbers here going from one up to eight. This is the axis that reflects an increasing serum creatinine. So it's normally around one and it can go to any number. This is something that we haven't talked about yet and it's called the glomerular filtration rate. The short form for this is GFR, the first letter of each of these. You're more familiar with EGFR. I'll tell you what the E means in a minute. So this is a plot of what the serum creatinine is versus what happens to the GFR. Now, what is the GFR? This is the key function that I was saying the creatinine reflects of the 100 or so functions in the kid. The G, it reflects what your GFR is. What is your GFR? The GFR or the glomerular filtration rate is a, a, a parameter that tells a physiologist or a doctor or a scientist how much water is coming through all the filters in both kidneys per minute or per hour. Or doesn't have to be minute here. It's per unit time. There's a certain amount of water that's coming through all our, the filters, the filtering unit of the kidney in a certain period of time. That's what the glomerular filtration rate represents. Now, in a normal kidney, the normal kidney actually filters about 100, 120 liters a day or mils per minute, roughly the same number. So imagine... Let's just, let's just say this was liters per day. We can do it per minute. It, it doesn't matter what period of time. Obviously, the shorter period of time, the less the fluid coming through. But let's take just a day. In a 24-hour period, both your kidneys, if you're normal, filter about 120 liters a day. So 72-liter Coke bottles are filtered every day. And if that's the case, your creatinine will be about one. As I decrease the amount of fluid coming through, the reason it's called glomerular is the filtering units in the kidney are called glomeruli in medicine. That's just their Latin name. You can call them filters. You don't. You can call this filtering filtration rate. Glomeruli is just the name of the filters, like bathtub drain. We could have called it bathtub drain filtering rate. It doesn't matter. It's arbitrary. It's just a Latin name. So all the filters in the kidney do this. They filter water. They filter other things too, but we're talking about water, how much water. The idea is the same. How much water is coming through your bathtub drain in a day? Same idea. If it's 120 liters, your creatinine will be one. If it's 60 liters, the creatinine will be two. That would be 50% of the function that I showed on the previous slide. But this is more now giving you not percent, but actual how much liters are coming through. So the normal 100% would be 120. If it goes to 50%, it goes to 60. If it goes to 
a quarter of normal, the creatinine will be up here at 430, would be a 25% of normal. Okay, that's how we have to think about it. So the creatinine gives us a reflection without measuring it of what our GFR is. Okay, that's the concept. Now, where does the E come from? The E means estimated because we're not measuring the GFR. We're measuring the creatinine and we're using an equation to predict what the GFR is. That's the whole point. The GFR, the eGFR is not a measured value. It's predicted from a curve like this. So it can be off. This is just, you know, um, sort of the average of what you'd predict, but it can be off by 15, 20%. And your creatinine's too, your GFR might be, true GFR might be 75. So when you get your eGFR back, it's not an actual measurement. Very, very important. Now, why do we care about the eGFR versus the creatinine? Why don't we just talk about creatinine? Why do we also have GFR on the lap slip? And that's because what we really want to know when we're assessing someone's this particular function of the kidney, we don't care per se what their creatinine is. As I say, it doesn't harm you. We wanna have an idea of what the ability of the kidneys is to filter water. That's the whole point. And we don't have a way to measure that. We used to measure it in the 60s and 70s. It was a nuclear test, so hospitals stopped doing it. And now they give what's called, the, we used to get just a GFR. There was no E in the 1960s and 70s in mid 80s. The E came about when people stopped measuring it directly. Okay, but that's the point is we're trying to get an idea of what the filtering ability of the kidneys is, and particularly the filtering of water. Because the diseases of the kidney, when they affect the filter, when those filters get plugged up, and I'll show you examples, and your GFR drops, that's when you need to go on dialysis. When your GFR drops down to here, to 15 or 20, your blood chemistry cannot be maintained because many other things are perturbed too along with that. And we need to correct that with what we call renal replacement therapy, either peritoneal hemodialysis or you get a kidney transplant. But you're fine in this range until you get down to about 30 or 25, until your creatinine gets up to about four, four and a half. Okay, so what we're trying to do when we measure the creatinine with very simple tests, been around for 80 years or more, is to get a, an idea of what, how much fluid all the filters in your kidney are filtering, how much water is coming through the bathtub drain, if you want to have a picture of it. Now, unlike the bathtub, we don't just have one drain. There's actually a million filters in each kidney. We have a million bathtub drains. <laughs> and the total going through all of them is 120 liters. You can divide this by 2 million to ca calculate how much is going through one of the filters. I mean, you don't need to, just as an example. So it's the sum of what all the filters are doing that give you the 120 liters a day. And different diseases of the kidney block those filters. And if they're blocked enough, you're gonna end up needing renal replacement therapy. So that's what the EGFR stands for. But remember, it's coming from an equation. It's not measured and it has an error in it. So when the doctor tells you your EGFR is 60, don't take that to the bank. It could be 50, it could be 70, it could be 70. It's just a guess. It's more important to trend it like trending a stock. The absolute value of it is not what's important. It's you want to keep it steady, whatever the number is with the error. If your EGFR is 45 on the lab slip, and it really could be 40 or 50, you just want it to be 45 all the time, even though, which means if it's truly 50, it's really 50 all the time. I hope that makes sense. It's the trend that's more important than the absolute number, at least in this range. When you get down to here, even with an error, you're getting into the range where you need renal replacement therapy.
So this is a complicated picture, but this just gives you an idea. This is a kidney cut and cross-section. If you cut a kidney, this is what you see. And all the filters are in this part of the kidney. So this kidney would have a million filters here, and they all join up, and they all join up into all the urine coming out into one tube that we call the ureter. This is one filter, one out of the million. You can't see with your eye. This is what you'd see under the microscope. So these are what all together determines your EGFR. This is where the water is filtered. This would be like one bathtub drain. You have a million of these all joining up together. It's not just a drain. We have a pipe coming out after, just like your bathtub does. And I won't get into what the rest of the pipe does today. I've spent my life studying what this part of the nephron does. Now, we have a third confusing thing. So we've talked about creatinine. We've talked about EGFR. And now we're going to talk about something else that's on the lad slip. And that's called CKD and CKD stage. And this came about in the last 20, 25 years. And what this concept tried to do was to just take your EGFR or GFR and break it up into what are called stages. Now, remember, it's a continuum. So the idea that there's a stage is somewhat confusing. It's not like a stepladder where you go from one to the other through steps. It's really a continuum. And so the staging is totally arbitrary. The fact that we subdivide the GFR, EGFR, into these different groups or different apartments is very arbitrary. If you really want to think about it correctly, it's a continuum. As you go from one, this to this to this, it doesn't jump from stage one to stage two. We make it look like that because we break these things down. So what was done was to say, okay, if the EGFR is above 90, we'll call that. You know, if it's 100, it's fine. You don't have any abnormality. Each of these is called CKD stage, by the way. The CKD just is an acronym for chronic kidney disease. That's all the CKD means. It doesn't mean anything. It's just an English word that doctors came up with 20, 25 years ago. They could have called it popcorn stages. It doesn't, there's nothing unique about it, about the word CKD. Just it was felt to be a term that best reflected perhaps what's going on. It's the word chronic is used because it tends to reflect problems that exist over a long period of time. In medicine, we divide things up into acute and chronic. Chronic just means to another human being, it's been around for a while. You know, chronic is used very commonly in medicine. Chronic heart disease, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, nothing unique about the word chronic. Um, so don't get hung up on that. And what was done was to plug in the different GFRs into a bunch of different stages. And a group of people sat around and came up with this. It didn't come from heaven. Just they decided this would be a nice way to break down the changing GFR in different patients. So anything over 90 to 100 was called stage one. They decided 60 to 89, they would call stage two. They decided 59 to 45 would be stage 3A. They decided to break up stage three into two groups. I don't know why they didn't call it three, four, break it up into three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They took three and broke it up further. It's confusing. Um, so again, they broke up Stage four, some people do. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is each of these GFRs that were predicted from the creatinine level that was measured were then plugged into a CKD stage. Okay. So that's where the CKD came from. But if you think about it logically, we're not saying anything new here. We have the creatinine. We're changing that into an estimated GFR. And then we're taking that GFR and we're plugging that into a name, a CKD name. There's no new medicine known from doing this. You're not measuring these things. It's just an arbitrary subdivision for doctors to think about ranges of GFR such that when it gets to less than 15, you would know that anyway without calling it stage CKD stage five. It's not telling you anything. But when the GFR gets below 15, you need dialysis or a transplant. You would know that whether you call this CKD stage five or not. 
So, and there's an arrow of time. It never goes from right to left. It goes from left to right. Now, you may not go left to right at all. You may have normal kidneys till you die at 120. And you don't go through this. Or you may go to stage two and stick there the rest of your life. Doesn't mean that you progress. You could go from one stage to the next. But one of the goals of nephrology science for those that do progress is to either slow down the time it takes or stop it altogether. Now, you could have people who are at stage five or stage four and just stick there. They went from one to four pretty rapidly, and all of a sudden they stayed at four and never go on dialysis. So the course that people take through these different GFRs varies depending on the individual and is not predictable. It's only somewhat predictable based on the disease that caused this. So we have hundreds of different diseases that can either cause the CKD abnormality uh, and these different processes in a general population health sense have somewhat predictable temporal predictability of going from one stage to the other over a certain period of time. For instance, if this is due to diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is the most common cause of CKD on the planet, if you get rid of type 2 diabetes, you get rid of half the kidney disease in the world, right? There's 800 million people with kidney disease. You'd cut it in half. You'd empty out half the dialysis units if you get rid of type 2 diabetes, something that's totally caused by being overweight, totally preventable without any research, without anything at all, just people having self-control over what they eat. You get rid of half the kidney disease on the planet. So this just shows, again, what I was saying. There's nothing new here. It's just another way of looking at it. It's sort of a cutesy slide where you see two nice kidneys here cut in half. Doesn't mean anything. And uh, what's shown here is the CKD stages again, five being the worst, one being the best. And then uh, English words here, which are again, arbitrary, mild, moderate, severe, or you can call these whatever you want, as long as the words reflect increasing severity. And then numerically, this arbitrary subdivision of the GFR, the filtration rate of the 2 million filters we have, based on ranges of abnormal filtration. And you can think of 100 as being the normal. But again, remember, as you age, this happens. The filtration decreases, and we do not cause that, call that a CKD stage. So if you're 75 or 80, and you're filtering you know, 80 mils per minute, so you're sort of CK between 1 and 2 if you were 30, we do not call that CKD. And yet many nephrologists aren't aware of it, and many primary care physicians are, and will say, oh, your EGFR came back at 80. You have CKD. You need to see a nephrologist, or a nephrologist may, may not realize it. And that's not correct. So you need to remember that. You know, you need to know how old you are, which I'm sure you do, and look it up as to what your GFR should be for your age. Now, if it's better than that, great. Your kidneys, it's not a given that your kidneys will decline like that. Obviously, there's a standard deviation. Some people decline to a greater degree, and that's more confusing because a greater decline with age still could be a normal decline in that particular person. That is something that obviously is not well studied and would be difficult to know. But you can certainly be 85 and have a GFR of, of 95 and don't have the decline, that's great. Now, as I said, diabetes is the most common reason the filters get clogged up, like your bathtub. Now, why is that? People think that diabetes is a sugar problem. Yeah, it is, but diabetes has other phenomenology that affect all the organs in the body. And one of them is it screws up your blood vessels. Okay. One of your goals in life should be to keep the millions and miles of your blood vessels healthy. And diabetes is one of the ways that they can get ruined. 
Now, why is it important to keep your blood vessels healthy? Because they're tubes and they have to have a certain diameter. They have to have, let the fluid flow through them. And when they get clogged, it's like, you know, something in your car, or you can think of anything, you know, a drain coming out of your toilet. Well, all the vessels in our body have to also be wide open in order to have the appropriate flow. Why? Because organs need oxygen. And so if you plug up the blood vessels in your heart, you're going to get a heart attack. You plug up the vessels in your brain, you're going to get a stroke. You plug up the blood vessels in your intestine, you're going to get an ischemic intestine or liver. All organs need oxygen. And the only way the oxygen can get to them is by having blood vessels that are wide open. So you have to do everything possible to keep all the blood vessels in your body always wide open. And, you know, it's a separate topic, obviously, than today. But diabetes, I'm bringing that up because diabetes narrows the diameter. This is a nice, normal blood vessel. Diabetes causes all this fat to accumulate in the wall. These are the fatty deposits. So the diameter is less, less blood flow, less oxygen getting to the tissues per unit time. And you can get blood clots. If this thing gets to like 5% of normal and it's your one of your coronary arteries, you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke in your brain. It's very scary. But there's an additional mechanism in the kidney. So the kidneys also need oxygen, need a flow. So the renal arteries can get screwed up in the kidney and you'll have less flow coming to the kidney and you can get CKD from that. The kidney will stop filtering as much. But the other important point for diabetes is that not only does it affect the blood vessels coming into the kidney, it screws up the filters. This is one of your 2 million filters, cut in section. This is what they look like under the microscope. This is a diabetic filter. It's all filled with junk. Look at all the purple junk here. It can't filter. It's no different than the drain in your bathtub getting clogged up. And so diabetes. And then when you have this, you're not going to have an EGFR of 100. Your EGFR might be 20, depending on how much the filter is screwed up. And as I say, the most common cause of this and this is being overweight. Totally preventable in most, most people, assuming they don't have a metabolic um, problem. Usually it's due to excessive food intake. So... Many companies are spending billions of dollars now to try to cause weight loss because humans can't do it on their own or to try to, if they're overweight and this is occurring, to rid the kidney of these deposits or prevent it from occurring in the first place. Billions of dollars because it's such a huge market. As I say, you stop this, you get rid of half the nephrology. Half the nephrologists are out of business. And it's going to happen. It's going to happen within the next... 10, 12 years, some bright young 20 year old is going to solve this. And there are trials with other drugs going on already. So, diabetic kidney disease, the big elephant in the room. Now, here's another reason for the filter to get ruined. And this is a young girl with what we call lupus. You can see um, the, it's called a butterfly rash. It's not a great term. There's no rash, her skin's completely normal. What you're actually seeing are dilated blood vessels through the skin because of, there's inflammation here and her cheeks are hot, but the skin itself is fine. This is not acne or anything. It's below the skin. But this inflammatory process doesn't just involve the skin and the hair and other things. It involves the kidney. Here's a normal filter again. And here's a, here's a filter from this uh, girl. Look at it. You can see that, again, it looks abnormal. Now, it's not abnormal because of because of the diabetic filter where you have these deposits in these are these little dots here are actually cells these are actually inflammatory neutrophil cells that have infiltrated the filter and are clogging it up so it gets clogged up the creatinine goes up the egfr goes down same pro same end result but the mechanism of what caused it is totally different the diabetic doesn't have any inflammatory cells those are protein deposits that clog up the foot. It's just like your bathtub drain could get clogged because there's hair in it or there's dirt because someone emptied a flower pot into the bathtub or whatever. I mean, the mechanism of how your bathtub drain gets blocked is multiple. It's same with same with nephrology. But the end result is that 
the water in the bathtub will overflow and the filtration through the filter will drop. So the same thing here, the creatinine will go up, which is analogous to the water in the bathtub increasing in height and the amount of fluid coming through the glomeruli or the filter will drop, which is the same thing as saying your EGFR is dropping. And so the treatment here is not to change her weight or anything, but to give her a drug to get rid of all these inflammatory cells. And that's what we do. Now, one of the new drugs that many of you might, some of you might be on or heard of are the SGLT2 inhibitors. And there's a whole bunch of them. They have, they have generic names here and they have trade names. You, know, you might've heard of Jardians, you might've heard of um, Invulcana, Corsiga. They're all the same thing. They all do the same thing. And they all actually block a protein called SGLT2. Actually, SGLT1 was discovered by Ernie Wright here, who was the chairman of physiology and wrote a paper in Nature, which even the students don't know about. Uh, he's still around, Ernie. But he discovered it. There was a paper in, um, I think it was 1989, 1990, some, something like that, where he discovered this protein described its sequence. And then... In the last 10, 15 years, a number of companies have created inhibitors for it, not because of, so the history of this is interesting. These compounds were created to block SGLT2, not to help CKD or the heart. They were done to block the sugar transport to help diabetics so that people with elevated blood glucoses, they pee out the glucose in the urine because this protein is important for glucose absorption in the urine. And that it, uh, it's it's sitting here. It's sitting right here, and what it does is it absorbs glucose with so, with sodium. It's part of sodium is part of sodium chloride, but this protein transports sodium and glucose, and it's because glucose sugar easily goes through this filter in normal people, and yet we don't pee out sugar in our urine if you're normal, and that's because SGLT2 brings it all back into the blood. So these people thought, okay, companies thought, in a diabetic with a high blood sugar, maybe I wanna pee out sugar in the urine to help lower the blood sugar. So I'll block the sugar absorption by making inhibitors to SGLT2. So that's what these drugs do. So what? why am I talking about that today? What does that have to do with CKD? And what does that have to do with the heart? Well, it turns out, when all these huge studies were done over the last 15 years, and they're still ongoing, big, big business, it was found that patients with heart disease do better. And it was also found that patients with CKD, some of them, the CKD seems to progress less. What does it have to do with inhibiting sugar absorption in the kidney? Well, people aren't exactly sure. There's many hypotheses. But just know that these drugs are sugar absorption inhibitors but they have this nice effect, which is why they're becoming a multi-billion dollar business of also seeming to protect the heart and also seeming to slow down patients going from one CKD stage to a worse one. So that's what these drugs are. And I'm sure you might've heard about them. Some of you may be on it. So they slow down in patients that are progressing, remember, as I said, not all patients progress, but they are slowing down in the ones, in some of the patients, um, including diabetics, their progression that would, would occur at rates that are somewhat predictable, it seems to be slowing that down. Now, it doesn't cure it. It just takes longer to progress to stage five where people start worrying about dialysis. Now let's look at some numbers here. And these aren't perfect numbers, but it gives you a rough idea. In the United States, there's about 650,000 people on renal replacement therapy, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Every year, about 100,000 new patients go on dialysis and about 100,000 of the patients that are on die. So it's a, sort of a steady state. 100 in, 100 out, the number stays around 650. Now, in the last year or so, a little more than a year, for the first time since these numbers have been recorded by the U.S. government, the number seems to be falling. 
at least in some ethnic groups. Now, the reason for that is thought to be multifold. One, during COVID, there were less patients who were being seen with CKD four and five, and perhaps there was a greater death rate prior to coming on to dialysis. So instead of being dialyzed, the CKD four and five patient, because a, a lot of medicine changed during COVID. People weren't getting their cancer appointments. People weren't getting all the rest of medicine sort of fell by the wayside to some extent, and people weren't being cared for with multiple problems, including nephrology. So one hypothesis is that perhaps people died prior to coming on to dialysis at a greater rate than normal. So this number of 100,000, if you take just sort of looking at it as a, as a concept, might have gone to 85 because there was a greater death rate before. That's a hypothesis. Another is that transplant programs started transplanting people at a higher EGFR. Instead of waiting to like 15 or 12, they were getting, and still occurring, it's pre called preemptive transplantation. They're getting transplanted now at a GFR of, let's say, 20 or 25, so they don't go on to dialysis. They get transplanted even before they've ever been treated with dialysis, which is great. Because, you know, the typical story is someone goes to CKD stage five, they then are not doing well, they go on to dialysis. While they're on dialysis, they go on the transplant waiting list, either living or deceased, and at some point they get a kidney. But they've gone through that dialysis phase, whereas now people are getting transplanted even prior to going on to dialysis, which is great. And that could be a reason that there's less than before or the number is declining. Another cause uh, that's hypothesized, although it might be too early, is we have better drugs now. The drugs, medicine gets better and better every year. You know, we don't go backwards. Uh, so you can count on medicine always getting better and better and better and people being cared for better and people living longer with a better quality of life. And the same thing may be occurring here that some of these new drugs, like the SGLT2 inhibitors and other drugs that are being used now, are slowing down the rate of progression from drops in the, in the EG, GFR until people need dialysis. It's a hypothesis. It might be too early. But the bottom line is empirically, for the first time since these numbers have been recorded, there's a decline. Now, whether that stays like it, and dialysis units are closing. As you may or may not know, there's two companies that basically run the dialysis business in the U.S., Davida and Fresenius, they have, you know, Davida has like 180,000 patients or so, Fresenius roughly that amount. They care for the majority of these patients. I mean, historically, when this these techniques started becoming more ubiquitous in the 70s, nephrologists would start a dialysis unit. It would be part of their business, part of their income. But that sort of fell by the wayside. And now it's run privately in the United States by these companies, by other companies too, but those are the big players. Now, I want to just segue a little bit. I didn't want to give the impression that the only thing a nephrologist assesses when you're assessed is how much fluid is coming your, through your glomeruli by assessing your creatinine. They also look at your urine, and they're looking at two things. First is they're looking at whether there's any protein in the urine, because normally the filter, those glomeruli, don't let, it's the opposite. They let water through, that's your 120 liters a day, but they don't let protein through if they're functioning normally. They prevent protein that's in your blood from coming out. There's two major proteins. One's called albumin. That's what egg white is. When you're eating egg white, you're eating one thing, albumin. Okay, And that's one of the most prevalent proteins in blood, and it does not normally come out into the urine. Very, very minor amount. The other is called globulins. Those are your antibodies things like that that are excessively made in certain cancers called blood cancers called multiple myeloma. Um, so the doctor, if they're worried about protein in the urine, will measure it. And there's two lab tests that you have to be aware of. One is called ACR and the other is called PCR. ACR stands for albumin creatinine ratio. 
Both are measured in the urine. This is not creatinine measured in your blood. They measure the albumin in your urine and the lab measures the creatinine in the urine and ratios them. Albumin divided by creatinine result. And the normal number is less than 30 milli milligrams of albumin per gram of creatinine. And that's what this MG slash G means. 30 milligrams of albumin per gram of creatinine should be under 30. If it's over 30, depending on how much, it's abnormal. They also measure what's called PCR, protein to creatinine ratio. Same idea, except it's not one protein called albumin. It's all the protein, albumin and all other proteins, totaled, not subdivided like we do with albumin. But it's the same idea, the total protein divided by the total cre by the creatinine, and that number should be 0.2 milligram of protein per milligram of creatinine. If it's over, you have too much protein in the urine. Now, you could have too much protein because you have too much globulins in the urine, and then your albumin will come up normal. But usually, when the protein is high, it's because the albumin protein was high by, by far. Usually, when you have protein in the urine, it's because of albumin being there. Okay, but remember, albumin is easy to remember because it's what you eat when you eat egg white. If you want to increase your albumin intake, eat an egg, not the yolk, the egg white. Very healthy for you. It's a great source of protein, albumin. Now, the other reason for looking at the urine is to see whether there's blood in the urine. The filter, the glomeruli, not only prevent protein from coming out into the final urine, they don't let any blood cells into the final urine. So these are things that are prevented from coming into the urine as opposed to water, which comes right through and you wanna have 120 liters a day coming through. You don't want blood in the urine and you don't want protein in the urine. It's the glomerulus that has the opposite function. It's a barrier to letting those. But when it's diseased, albumin will come into the urine and also red cells. So you can have urine looking clear or it can be blood, just depending on how many red cells are there. The worse the permea permeation of red cells, the redder the color. It's the red cell that's red in your blood. Now, you could still have blood in the urine, but you can't see it with your eye. And the doctor will look on, not the doctor, the lab looks under the microscope. So what the lab will send back it was, is, is what's called a... Uh, urinalysis or urine microscopy, where the technician looks under the microscope and sees whether there's any red blood cells. And there are usually a few, it's like four or five or six per field. But if it's 50 or 60, you have what we call hematuria. Hematuria means blood in the urine. Now we divide that up into microscopic hematuria and macroscopic hematuria. Micro means it's only seen by a microscope. Macro means it's seen by your eye and a microscope. So we assess also blood in the urine. And I'm not showing here, we also assess whether you have bacteria in the urine, very common in 20 year old sexually active girls, women in their 20s with multiple partners often get urinary tract infections, although it can occur in people who are in their 70s and 80s, 90s also. It's, it's important if, you, if uh, you have an elderly parent um, or you're elderly yourself, and suddenly your mental status changes. Some you just you have a spouse who's acting really weird. You have to think that it could be a urinary tract infection, even if they don't have a fever. It's very common to have a parent in a nursing home or relative, or perhaps yourself, who suddenly someone says, you know, you're acting weird. And of course, people deny it. They're not aware what's happening. They're just acting strange. It's not something you should think of like a stroke or a brain issue. It's very common for any infection to manifest as altered mental status changes. And the most common infection in the elderly is urinary tract infection. And they're often missed. You give them an antibiotic and they're fine. Now that's not always the case because there's a paradoxical thing that can happen in the elderly when they go on antibiotics. And that antibiotics might not just get rid of, you know, the infection in your hand or something, but they also wipe out the bacteria in your intestine. 
It's called the intestinal flora. We all have millions of different bacteria in our intestine. And they're making all sorts of compounds that go in our blood. And we're sort of living with this colony of, an, of organisms. And we're fine. But if you wipe those out in someone who's 80 or 85 or 90, they can actually become altered mentally. Because all of a sudden, the organic compounds that were produced are now changed. And the brain is very sensitive to that. So it's, very, it's, 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 it's not uncommon. And it's really not recognized by doctors. You have some, let's say, parent who's 90 in a nursing home. And the nurses call you and say, you know, your father is acting weird. Your first question should be, did you check for urinary tract infection? They go, why are you saying that? And you say, I want a doctor to see him. And then you have to convince the doctor half the time, too, because they only come in for three seconds. That's a separate problem. But if they do find an infection, what happens is they go on the antibiotic. The first two or three days, they're getting better. And the infection's cleared, and all of a sudden they're getting worse again. It's not because necessarily the antibiotic wasn't working. It's because the antibiotic was knocking out all your father's intestinal flora, and now they have mental status changes because of the intestinal flora being knocked out. So I always recommend in people that are in their 80s and 90s who go on an antibiotic for every reason to take probiotics or yogurt. You want to replenish the normal bacteria in the intestine. It's very important. You go on an antibiotic, just take probiotics. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. Now, it's not going to replicate what you had exactly before, but it will definitely decrease the chance of getting mental status changes paradoxically due to being on the antibiotic, which, which few doctors recognize. And many times I've recommended that uh, to the elderly who have gone on an antibiotic, to just preventatively go on a probiotic also or yogurt. And you can Google it. There's different yogurts that are better, that have more bacteria, different probiotics. You know, look at good, look at reviews. Don't just uh, look at ads. So if your EGFR goes below 15, you're just going to have a whole bunch of things happen, which I won't get into today. They're going to, that where your kidney can no longer maintain the blood chemistry and you need renal, what we call renal replacement therapy. It's called RRT as an acronym. So one is hemodialysis, which has been around the 40s, was invented in the Netherlands in Nazi occupied Germany. The other is peritoneal dialysis, where there's no blood, no needles, and there's a catheter put in the what's called the peritoneal cavity here. And it, it can actually be like a balloon. It's normally flat, but you can fill it with a lot of fluid. And the machine fills it with the correct fluid. It's called a dialysate solution. It stays in the abdomen for two hours and then it's drained. And it's all done by a machine automatically. You're sleeping. It's done at night. And you have eight of, four of these exchanges usually in eight hours. So it's instilled over five, 10 minutes sits inside for two hours, then drained over five minutes or so, and a new bag is put in. In the morning, you unhook yourself, and you go about your day. So this is the, this is the optimal way to be dialyzed, not hemodialysis. This is done daily. Hemodialysis is done three times a week. This is done more gently and slowly, and so you don't get the big switch changes in your blood chemistry. I mean, think about it. The kidney's working 24-7. Hemodialysis is three times for three and a half hours at a time. You know, it's the bare minimum to keep the chemistry normal. And obviously, in the day off day, so you're dialyzed Monday, Wednesday, Friday, hemodialysis, not this. This is daily. Hemodialysis, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. On the days you're not being dialyzed, your blood chemistry gets perturbed again. So it's swinging up and down with hemodialysis. And it's only not done daily because the feds won't pay for daily. You know, they, they want to pay for the minimum amount that's required. Remember, dialysis is covered by Medicare. Since a group of nephrologists went to the federal government in the 70s and said, we have this new technique, it would be unethical for the United States, such a rich country, not to look after patients now that can get dialyzed. So they finally convinced the feds to make it part of Medicare. The prediction was it would cost about 250 
million dollars a year. In 2021, the U.S. government spent $114 billion, with a B, on the care of kidney patients. That's about one-ninth of the entire Medicare budget is spent on kidney, kidney disease. So it's a huge, huge expense for the federal government. Now, just to give you an idea of comparing the mortality of patients with kidney disease to cancer, many people would be amazingly surprised that there's 100,000 deaths, as I showed on the other slide, from kidney disease a year, compared to 43,000 with breast cancer. The deaths from kidney disease is two and a half times breast cancer, roughly three times prostate cancer. It exceeds colon cancer by twice. The only cancer that has more deaths per year is lung cancer, and it's not that much more. And yet the amount of funding for research that goes into cancer compared to kidney disease is like an elephant compared to an ant. And I won't get into why that is today. And if you want to contact me or email me, I can get into great length about it. But I have spent my life trying to get research money to study kidney disease and, and study the kidney. And it's an uphill battle for kidney researchers in general. Now, a transplant, some of you are aware of it, but it's a question we're always asked. What happens to the other kidneys? The answer is we leave them in and you have three kidneys. And the reason for that, and it's put in the front, it's not put in the back, it's hooked up to different set of arteries and veins. It's about three centimeters below the surface in the front. The reason we leave these in is because if these have any function at all, even if it's 15% of normal, the kidney does not only, does not only filter, as I said, the EGFR refers to one of many hundreds of functions. The kidney also is a hormone making machine. It makes erythropoietin, a hormone that is essential for making your blood. So the kidney makes this hormone and then it goes to the bone marrow and your bone marrow makes your red blood cells. That prevents you from not getting anemic without erythropoietin, you can't make hemo red cells, you get, you get anemic. And before erythropoietin was cloned in the 80s, that's how Amgen became a multi-billion dollar company. One of their scientists cloned erythropoietin and now it's you know, multi-billion dollar drug, not just for kidney patients, but for cancer patients, other patients, to stop anemia from occurring. So when these kidneys, when your kidneys don't work, you stop making erythropoietin very important. So the kidneys also have not, this has nothing to do with filtering anything. It just makes this hormone. The kidney also makes another hormone called 125 vitamin D. The vitamin D you buy in the pharmacy is not the active form of vitamin D. The vitamin D needs to be modified that you buy, you take in your pills. It's modified by the kidney and convert the, the vitamin D you buy in the pharmacy is 25 vitamin D. It's called 25 vitamin D chemically it's turned into 125 there's a it's it's called one alpha hydroxylation there's another hydroxyl group that's added that makes it active now and by active i mean that it works on making calcium metabolism and your calcium health your bones not uh, not get uh, um, what's called osteoporosis or osteopenia so you need the kidney in order to have normal healthy bones and so if we took these kidneys out, not only would the kidney not, not only would the patient have less erythropoietin hormone, they would have less vitamin D, active vitamin D. Now, if the kidney is very perturbed, we see that in CKD patients prior to their transplant. There's not enough erythropoietin, or on dialysis patients who have very little kidney function. They don't have enough erythropoietin, so we have to give them the hormone made by Amgen and they don't have enough 125 vitamin D, we have to put them on that too. They can take as much 25 vitamin D from the pharmacy as they want. They will not make 125 unless we give it to them. So hormone production by the kidney is very important. And so we don't want to remove these because there's still some hormonal production left. And obviously the new transplant will take up the rest of the slack for the hormone production if the transplant doesn't get rejected and is working. The future, 
um, drugs that prevent CKD from going all the way to ESRD or slow it down at least. Artificial kidney, which we've been working on here for eight years. And then something called xenotransplants, which means interspecies transplant. And so there's billions of dollars being put into creating pigs whose kidneys won't be rejected by humans, or at least will only require the drugs that are now given to human transplants. Not that they absolutely, in an absolute sense, won't reject, but that they'll only require the drugs that are used now normally for, for human transplants. Okay, and with that, I'll stop here and be glad to uh, take any questions you might have.